Okay. So if I think back, I, I think the first time that, that you and I met each other, albeit virtually, um, I'm going to say summer of 2020. Yep. Um, both just started an MBA program through the Open University. And we were talking about some of the ideas around how some organisations are, are purpose-led. So they offer perks to their staff like gym membership and mm -hmm. counselling and uh, activity days out and holidays with the family alongside work. And, and a lot of people we were talking with at the time thought this was a fad. Right? This is just a gimmick. This is just marketing. It's just a way of an organisation making noise. And you didn't. And you did actually surprise me a little bit. And please don't judge me for that. Mm -hmm. Um, where you said, well, actually, no, wouldn't it be awesome if you got to work with people that you actually liked, mm -hmm. that actually you wanted to spend time with, and even better than that, that you were contributing to something tangible, something bigger, you know, you're actually leaving a bit of a legacy. And these are really simple words to say, but that really stood out to me. It's also quite hard to argue with. So I thought, really appreciate your time today, um, and I, just to sit here and just have a, a bit of a conversation around what leadership means to you. Maybe we can bring in some of the ideas from the MBA, which we've been doing, um, some of your own work experience, um, and some of the things you do outside work. Sounds good. Okay. Um, well, this is, I mean, this is all topics we've spoken about before, isn't it? Around leadership and around specifically the MBA. And the MBA we're studying is is really, really good, I think, at equipping you with um, skills such as how do you develop a strategy? You know, those yep. things, or how do you understand um, finances and all of these things. But I don't know about you, but if you recall, actually, the interview that took place and completely different people, I assume, but you had an interview before you started and, and they wanted to understand whether you were the right candidate for the course. Mm -hmm. And personally, my conversation was a lot around my personal uh, leadership style, my personal management style and my interest in that, actually. And it wasn't necessarily all of these skills that we're learning. It's more about the soft skills. Because you like what we've said before, you can have the best strategy in the world. But if you haven't got people within the organisation um, that are bought into that and want to be a part of that and want to go back to the culture, um, it's not going to work. Absolutely. And so for me, the, what the MBA is missing, this personally equips me with tons and tons of skills. But you don't you're not born a natural leader, I don't think. and You're not born um, a good manager. Mm -hmm. And these are skills that you have to develop and you have to learn over time. Now, you and I have gone some way in, in developing and learning all, the, all of those skills because we've been in our jobs, well, me, you know, over 20 years and you've got <laughs> a lot of experience and you learn along the way. Yeah. But I think with this MBA, it's not teaching you any of those kind of soft skills. It's more it's more factual. And just going back to um, what really resonated with me in your last podcast when you interviewed, and I know it wasn't his quote, it's Peter Drucker's quote, but where they said, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast and it's so true mm -hmm. you can have the best strategy best plan but if you haven't got the people within the organization like I said that's brought into that they want to contribute to it they want to work with you to make the company success it won't be agreed agreed so there was um, I listened to a podcast recently and they were um, with two American war historians and they were talking about well, what what leadership is in a military context very simple, but I quite liked it. They said basically a leader's role is to articulate a vision of the future and then to convince a followership to realise that, mm -hmm. that that leadership, uh, that vision rather. So it's as simple as that. It's, it's having an idea and then convincing other people it's the best thing since sliced bread and then use helping them achieve it. Yeah. So that, that's interesting because um, so let, let's think about our, our own experiences. And this is where I think you can pull the most valuable um, like learnings from actually. A few, I'm going to ask you the same because I know if you said to me, think about your past experience, where you've worked and tell me or picture in your head who was a good leader. And I know immediately who will appear in my head. Mm -hmm. And then if you ask me the same, well, who have you worked with that is not a good leader? And I can give you these traits. So where I worked many, many years ago, the, the best I've, I've spoken about this before with you, the best place I've ever worked. These leaders were so inspirational we used to walk into a room and this was you know one of my first jobs out of university and you used to sit in a room and you used to think blimey I want to be like them they had a presence around them they knew what they were doing but they were very respectful in the way they did it they um, had 100% investment in developing you the company I worked for developed you from the day dot um, all of communication was clear 
and it wasn't one of these development programs. You know, we would have to have them, you know, what's your three month goal, what's your six month goal? And it's almost like a tick box exercise. It wasn't this. This is about developing somebody's individual um, skill set. And all of these people evidently have gone on. These are all like SVPs of companies. They've gone so, so far. And every single person that you've come across that was in that leader position has just rocketed in terms of their career. And then I think about, like, let's do the flip side, and I'll let you answer in a moment. Like, well, what doesn't make a good leader? And it's really interesting because I think we've all worked for places where, um, and I hate to say this, it tend, tends to be more male, but not always. But we get these people who believe they're strong leaders because they do the kind of the scaremongering tactics, you know, and everybody follows their lead because they're scared not to. Mm -hmm. That doesn't I've make a good leader. <laughs> so you can talk about your own experience and it's two different types of person. And going back to the MBA and we do learn about culture, don't we? We do learn about the whole bureaucratic yeah, yeah, culture absolutely, absolutely. and all of that. And it surprises me to this day how that still is in existence. But that's not that's not what they should be teaching you to be like. You want to be kind of the first version that I was referring to. Absolutely. So th thinking my own head of, of some examples, um, I think that's quite vivid, actually. I, I think what you're referring to there is a lot of people and a lot of organisations think of leaders of having these masculine traits. So a, a difference here in my mind between masculine traits and men. Um, because quite often you can see examples of women who have found themselves in leadership positions who are mirroring those masculine traits. They are. And I think that's better put than how I put mm -hmm. it, because that's what I mean. Um, it's masculine. or I suppose it's not fair to call them masculine traits anymore. There is it. But I guess traditional ma masculine traits, and you're absolutely right. And where you've seen women rise up the ranks, they have adopted these ma what we're going to call masculine traits for the mm -hmm. purposes of this conversation. And that I'm going to be almost scary. You know, and that's why you am dominant. I'm going to be loud. I'm going yeah. to be confident. I'm going to be decisive. I'm going to yes. be a public speaker. I'm going to be in your face. Yes. If someone answers, asks me a question, I'm answering it now. Yeah. Because that's what confident masculine yeah. leaders do. But it's interesting um, that a lot of organisations were have taken the time to say, well, how do those traits or people who demonstrate those traits, how does that link to their performance? So as at an organisational level, we're talking about senior leaders here. How does the CEO, who is confident, loud, quick decision maker, good public speaker, how does that, has, how does that impact the revenue of the organisation? You know, I'm not talking over a quarter, I'm talking medium term here, so three to five years, um, versus how do people who display different, more feminine approaches, people take a little bit more time, a little bit more emotionally intelligent, a little bit more empathetic in the way they do business, actually take the time to understand the people they work with and build trust with them. And that, that's, that's yeah, exactly, and that's more um, uh, a longer game, if you like. Mm -hmm. So if you go in with these dominant masculine traits and, and you want something to happen, chances are if you take that approach, you're going to get a very short term success because yeah. people are just yeah. going to follow fall in line. The problem what it doesn't do, though, is if you don't have that investment in people and you have that emotional intelligence and in dealing with people in a different way, people are very soon going to uh, not want to be there. You know, they're not going to have that long term commitment to the company. Whereas if you want to do, like do the longer game and actually, you know, tap into emotional intelligence and treat people differently. And this is where you're starting to develop and grow a culture that allows people to grow and contribute and all of that thing. Maybe you won't get the immediate um, increase in sales revenue or whatever it is you're trying to do. But what you do, you are doing is you're growing a far more successful longer term culture. Well, I think you've said it to me before. If if someone, if an individual is adding value to the bottom line, then they're employable. It, they might have the best ideas in the world, but if they're not adding to that bottom yeah. line, then they're not. And I'm saying bottom line. That's really what I'm saying. There is how that company defines value. Uh, I suppose something which is worth considering is um, perspective. Okay, so uh, let's define this as frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And if so, when you're when you're making a, a judgment about anything, so whether this is making a decision or which course of action to take. Actually, you've got to have something against which you can measure how, how comfortable you are with that. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often, those are your own, your own values, your own beliefs, and arguably your own lived experience. So if you've seen this happen before, you have an idea as to what's about to go wrong. So you may say, well, clearly that's not the right way of doing it. But that might have been a completely different time, different technology, different people, mm -hmm. different team, different culture, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think there's a bias there that we kind of need to recognise. So when you're coming to a decision with the team, you can't just purely use your own judgment 
as the way of making sure it's the right answer. And I think Steve Jobs is very well known for that. It's not you know, his way of making sure that Apple don't make a decision that's wrong by asking as many people that he trusts as possible mm -hmm. what's about to go wrong with this idea I'm proposing. So have you got any thoughts there in terms of how you can reduce your own biases, how you can um, encourage, you know, create the environment to open up your own eyes rather than just running in with that masculine trait, got to make a decision quickly, got to go with this and be seen to be doing that. So have you got any, any thoughts there? Well, I just think it's about um, being able to create within your team um, the space um, for people to be able to speak up and say what they feel without any um, of us consequences right so um if somebody doesn't agree with you then they're able to stand up and they're able to say their piece um and you can take that into account you know uh, with the forward decisions that you're going to make um and being accepting of other people's opinions and beliefs as well and without that concern that it, you're not it's not a creation of conflict it's a creation of different ideas does that make sense that's what it is mm -hmm. And because there's no way in your headspace you're going to have an answer for absolutely everything. And given the fact that in within your team, everybody's got different experiences, somebody else might have seen that in the past and have a better idea than you. Mm -hmm. And it, you can't just be like, no company is run by one person. It's just not. Successful companies aren't. They're run by multiple people because everybody has a different skill set and everybody has got different advice to give. And that's what's really important. And you know, as well as a person, as you grow and you have more experiences, then you can take you take that with you to the next project, to the next job. So you've got to see all of these other people's having that as well. I mentioned already about the importance of alignment. So I think what we're talking about here and using Pascagena as an example, personally, yeah, absolutely. I'm in, you know, because that that organization and, and how it does business and how it's structured is aligned with a lot of my own values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, that alignment is important, but for others, works work. As long as I've got the money coming in, yeah. I can do what I need to do. I can, I can, I can go home. So how do you see that? Well, well but that goes back to um, you know the hierarchy of needs because everybody's there for a different reason. Mm -hmm. So what drives you and I is very different. Like I said to that lady I worked with, you know, a good few years ago, um, and so I can't answer that. I can only answer it for myself. You know, and I think what would drive me is being part of a company and a culture that I truly believe in. And that does mirror the same beliefs and values that I have, because that's the thing that's going to make you get up and want to go to work and enjoy life. And at the end of the day, when you're looking now at work life balance, which we have been doing way more than ever in the last 18 months because of the pandemic, I think what you're going to see is a shift in people realising actually what drives them and what makes them happy and aligning themselves with those sorts of companies. Absolutely. And, and, and I think uh, it's not just a British trait, but quite often people only know what's important when it's taken away from them. So actually, if you're somebody who really needs that freedom, who really needs access to hell, it might be the pub, the social aspect, maybe you actually genuinely, that is your, your, your cathartic exercise at the weekend. Once that's taken away from you, you actually really start to understand it. Um, and you've given the space, you then get to reflect on, well, is it Fred that I like having a pie with at the pub or is it actually I'm in an unhappy relationship or is it that actually I don't like my work anymore and these things is this yeah, a coping exactly. mechanism I guess is what I'm saying. And you're right you're stripping everything back so if we take the last 18 months as an example so um, for many people you know everyone loved their jobs but probably didn't realise what they loved so say take us uh, an example that that lady I keep on referring to okay so that her driver is to be part of a team and to have that social aspect you know that's why she went to work mm -hmm. she didn't need the money you know she could have worked anywhere else but it, w it was that so over the last 18 months if you think about that when you start stripping that out and take um, her for example she'd be at home working remotely um doing exactly the same tasks as she would in the office but i can tell you now she'd be extremely extremely unhappy because you've taken away that teamwork and that human element of it mm -hmm. and i think over the last 18 months i think we've gone from one extreme to the other so we've gone from having a culture where you know it's a lot we've had to be sat in the office and we've got to be doing that to the initial excitement of all you know everybody can work remotely working from home this is fantastic and now we've actually gone into the next phase oh crikey we've lost the human element and, and we've um, we've discussed this a lot what does that mean all right let me, let me push you a bit further on this then so if we're saying that actually as part of a leadership role is that um uh, creating an environment where people can connect so you're almost rather than 
these things accidentally happening, it's going to happen by design now, which initially feels a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit cold, um, because you're forcing people to connect mm. with others, you're forcing people to have meaningful relationships. Um, but arguably, maybe that's the one which we're occupying at the moment. So as, as a leader, have you got any thoughts as to how you can actually uh, create an environment where those connections are, are more likely to form, that they are more, more meaningful and less transactional? I had a recent conversation about this and once again I think it's going to go to bit back to old school techniques like I said I'm a firm believer and you know you're going to work you're going to have the best results and work well with people if they like you and like I said it doesn't have to be on a social level but just like you and respect you on, on that work level and I think um, to be able to do that you have to build relationships in person and going back even you know the good old, you know, team building days and, and things like that, where actually you're doing something other than engaging solely in work and, and generating conversations and getting to know other people. At the end of the day, people are going to do things for you if they like you. We all know this, you know, if you get in a bit of a, a pickle at work, who are you going to call? Who's going to help you? You're going to go to the person that you have a relationship with mm -hmm. and vice versa. So then you just start naturally working better together. And also, when you have that relationship, you are wanting success for everyone, not just yourself. You're not just going to work because I want to be Bingo. paid. You're going to work because you want everybody else to succeed because you have that relationship with them. And that's the key. So, um, author I really like, Patrick Lencioni, great book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which I've mentioned in the past. But there it's, he, he pronounces that actually, if you want a group of people to come together, so whether it's a new team or, or a mature one, You've got to build trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've abso absolutely got to trust each other. And you know, the, the uncomfortable reality of that is you've got to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. so that's that's inevitable. Once you've got trust, you can then have genuine conflict. So you're not just sitting there nodding at each other. Yep. You're not ignoring each other. You're comfortable you're with saying actively yes. challenging. This isn't a personal attack on you, Susan. I'm just saying yep. I'm concerned about what you're proposing. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, that's the Steve Jobs thing of, of coming up with, you know, with with better answers. You then get commitment. So this is actually people buying into the decision which is made. Mm -hmm. So it may not have been the answer that you've came up that you would have proposed, but you believe in what's, what's being proposed the result. And if you're committed to it, you're much more likely to make it happen. Accountability. So you can actually hold each other to account. So, well, you made the decision here, Susan. You said by the first this thing was going to happen. Um, you need to come to the table with the results. And if, you've, if you're committed by that point, you're much more likely to, to, to see that um, accountability. And the final one, of course, is results. Yeah. You know, the, the team actually deliver whatever the thing yeah. is, whatever widgets that team have been tasked, mm. tasked with and um, with producing. Yeah, and I think with accountability though, I think it's really important to be, um, to stress that it's not about being able to point the finger because it was your fault because you made that decision. Mm -hmm. I think in a workplace, I, I like prefer the word like transparency, you know, and trans to be transparent is really important and to be able to be transparent to whoever you're talking to. And by that, I mean, OK, so you've absolutely committed to deliver a project on Monday, but for whatever reason, you know, what happened on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday did not enable you to do that. And it's to be able to have the space and be able to be transparent to the receiving party to say, I know that I, um, you know, committed to that date, but I haven't been able to because of X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important part. OK, um, I mean, let's, let's end with a thank you, shall we? Uh, so, first of all, appreciate your time um, and, and definitely some of, the, some of the comments we've had over the last 45 minutes. I wouldn't say we've necessarily or, always agreed on them, um, but that's that's half the fun of this. So, just thinking through some of the things which you've explained to me there, um, I think firstly, within modern leadership, that clearly there's a role for the individual, but the much bigger, more complicated thing is that the mass, colourful, complex web that sits around that leader um, and the fact this isn't just a traditional hard skills anymore, which is as a, somebody who identifies as a civil engineer is quite uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that nuance, all of that colour, all those soft skills is becoming ever more important, albeit in a, in a, in a, a sort of much more digital environment. So thanks again for your time. Um, I've really enjoyed it and I'm really confident that people watching this will have taken a few things which hopefully they can weave into their own practice. Thanks, so, David. Thank you.